for Miss J. We decided to give it a go with metformin and lifestyle changes. Um, she she commits to these. We do some counseling. We give her some of our favorite handouts. She comes back for follow up several months later, and she's not been able to make the changes. Some of them because life is challenging. It's hard to make these changes. Um, she's gained some weight, and she's also not tolerating the metformin very well. She's having some GI side effects that just are, are not making it worth her while right now. Uh, so we repeat her A1C, and unfortunately, it has crept up to 11%. She still uh, would like to avoid injections if at all possible and would like to try another oral medication. Um, and I, I would love, love to hear your approach to this situation specifically. And we, we've talked, we've kind of alluded to the SGLT2s a couple of times now, but I, I would love to hear if this is some, someone where you might consider starting that as initial therapy or if there's a reason why you might not in this particular patient. Right. Well, I'm going to assume, Paul, that we did evaluate her, you know, her beta cell reserve and all of that stuff. So she doesn't have type one. This is type two. Um, and that's a really high A1C. You know, I, I know before we don't have a threshold above which we start insulin. And I don't think insulin's the right medicine for her right now. But, um, but she's starting to make you know, me nervous because, you know, we don't really know this, but we think even the first year of glucose, you know, A1C over 10% probably has some impact on your overall health. Um, she's probably having, if you ask her, she most, she very likely has a yeast infection and she's probably really miserable. Um, so I always make sure I do have my, my, my injectables in my pocket so that I can take it out and make it very comfortable and casual. And I, I often show videos of, uh, to my patients. Sometimes I accidentally put on a video of a child doing an injection. <laughs> because <laughs> Wait, where can we find, are these from the manufacturer website or YouTube? Are, yeah, usually can we share the these link? Yeah, sure. It's a TikTok you, video. <laughs> yeah, usually. Well, actually there are some pretty awesome TikTok videos, but I don't go there. I usually use the manufacturer ones. Um, okay. But, uh, but just so they, they understand that it's okay and that they're so fortunate that actually they're in a situation where they really could do once a week injection, you know, that's actually not too bad. And they're, they're not really in a safe spot. So serious things sometimes call for serious measures. So I, I try to make sure they get that. Um, but, but if really, um, if really she's not going to go there, I would make sure that we have her on extended release metformin because metformin is a potent drug. I doubt she's taking it. If she doesn't feel good on it, she's probably skipping it half the time. Even if she doesn't know she's doing that or remember, she's, she's probably doing that. So I would try that and um, make sure she's drinking enough water. Now, the SGLT2 inhibitor is not ideal um, for somebody this hyperglycemic in my, my practice, especially for women, but I'm going to say across the genders, because you do see more side effects related to the glucose, the glycosuria. So you're going to see women will describe more yeast infections to the point where, um, you know, I've seen some pretty serious like perineal tinea. You, you just don't want to mm -hmm. go there. I mean, you can have a patient requiring uh, antifungal treatment for months if yeah. you make the wrong move here. Um, and, and for men and women, you have that, you can have that issue. And then the polyuria is really miserable at this stage with that level of A1C. So I, I do have a policy to get people, you know, below, below nine before I start an SGLT2. That's my little, do I, do I break that rule sometimes? Sure. But the, it's it's because I'm trying to protect my patient from from that side effect that I can predict pretty nicely, and again, make sure you ask her about yeast infection. Do women women suffer in silence with yeast infections their whole life, and they might not connect it to their diabetes. The worst thing to do would be to prescribe an SGLT two if she already <laughs> has a yeast infection. Yeah, it's but you know so so we would get to that. Um, sometimes if we're busy, so. If I consider the SGLT2, I'll describe that to her. And then that usually will make her say, oh, you know, I already have that right now. I have that going on. Um, so what would, I, what would I do? Honestly, I would really just encourage her to do a GLP-1. There is an oral GLP-1, as we know. Semaglutide has an oral version. And it's probably the best idea if she can afford it. And then I'm just going to put it out there. If she, if cost is a real issue, her A1C is high enough that I would probably do 
a sulfonylurea temporarily in combination with metformin extended release to get some to get some progress here. You know, we got to get our A1C down. And I like the temporary sulfonylurea even in a patient with obesity who cannot access the GLP one. Um, mm-hmm. And and it's too high for the SGLT2. It it works. Tell us about the extended release trick. I would love. I, I've heard this approach before, and I'm not sure we've talked about this on the show. But for someone who who has GI intolerance, how how do you make that conversion? Sort of how do you switch them over to an extended release, and what what does that yield you? Because I'm not sure that we've discussed this before. Yeah, great. It, it's um you know most of our uh, automatic titration programs that some of us have set up in different practices here with pharmacists. We, they actually always start with extended release. They don't even bother with the regular stuff because of the GI intolerance. The price is the same now, as long as you don't try to prescribe Glumetza, which is a brand name of metformin, which is completely unaffordable. So it's the metformin ER uh, is usually, or XR, and it only comes in 500 milligram tablets, so patients don't like that because they like their 1,000 milligram. Mm. But it's a smaller tablet, so some people are fine with it. They can take two and two if they're on the maximum dose of 2,000. The dosing's the same, so your max dose will be 2,000 a day, maximum effective dose. You can officially take, you know, 2550 of metformin. That's what the package insert says, but that doesn't. You don't get much more after 2,000 milligrams. So they can take all four pills at the same time they could. instead of having to take two in the morning, two at night. They can do that. What, in my experience, it, the effect isn't truly 24 hours. So I actually mm. do split it up and do okay. this <laughs> two and two, um, even though that doesn't sound like it makes sense. But for yeah. adherence, I mean, you got to remember, guys, like 50% of the prescriptions we fill are not being taken in a year. Yeah, that the patients fill. So, and I just want to be clear. I just because I feel like this comes up a lot in clinics. So, it's, you're not really you're not changing the dose at all. You're just mitigating the side effects by. That's so, right. it's still one gram twice a day. It's just a you different formulation. It. Okay, that's right. And can I just ask? Because I I've tried to look this up before. Like, does it work better? Is it how how good is the evidence that the that that formulation is tolerated better? Because I I know you know I know that's the hope with it. It's a good question. I the only studies are with this Glumetza drug. Because uh, okay. remember, metformin is um, is so old, nobody's going to actually study it. And even the ER is generic. Um, right. But Glumetza, that, that's, it's a different micro, um, I forget, micronized formulation. So it's unique. Okay. And they did, they did definitely prove in a randomized trial that it's better tolerated. It's not the same as the extended release metformin, but in my practice, it makes a difference, I would say 60 to 70% of the time. And then there's a group, you know, a good chunk who just, if they don't do feel well on a center release, you just have to say goodbye to metformin most of the time. This is the kind of expert opinion people come to the show for. This is, I mean, this is why you're really delivering. And I, <laughs> okay, the other question, good. and do you do the other trick I've seen is actually having the patient when you're sort of up titrating the, the the dose for tolerability you actually start at nighttime. Is that something else that you recommend? So yeah, I so do. like starting at 500 at nighttime, then maybe increasing it at nighttime, and then mm-hmm. once they sort of build a tolerance, then actually start doing it during the daytime. Is that a reasonable thing to try? Yes, totally. And I've seen, you know, my internal medicine colleagues do a much better job than I do at slow titration metformin. Um, I would just say that the extended release kind of allows you to go a little faster. So you don't have to do that 250 milligrams at night, which I see sometimes and I get it, believe me. (laughs) But that was when we couldn't get extended release because it wasn't really cheaper, but it's the same. I mean, it wasn't as as cheap, but it's actually the the generics are the they're 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 on the tier one whatever yeah the, they're the all lower, the cheap. lower tier yep yep 